I've spent my life in Georgia and love hiking all over, but I must admit, North Carolina has the best mountains. For this reason, I frequently drive up there and hike and camp. This time, I went up with my family in an RV and stayed with them in Maggie Valley. The next day, however, I had them drop me off about 10 miles away at the Cold Mountain Trailhead, and I planned to hike up and spend the night and be back down in the morning. I was by no means inexperienced at hiking or camping, but I had never camped alone. On top of that, I didn't bring a pistol. On the way up, the trail was surprisingly strenuous, not necessarily steep. I've hiked some steep stuff out in the west, but more like a ton of ups and downs and feeling like it wouldn't end. Eventually, it began to get darker and I realized I needed to stop and set up while I still had light. So I stopped about a half a mile short of the summit and figured I would continue in the morning. Nothing eventful happened. I set up camp in a really good spot, ate my food, and went into the tent. At this point, I realized I hadn't run into a single other person my entire way up. This wasn't eerie at the time, but soon would be. I have trouble sleeping and usually lay awake for up to an hour trying to sleep. I thought I heard someone lightly walking around the general area because of the rhythm of the steps. I brushed it off as my mind running wild, but I did pull my big old knife out of my bag and put it next to me in the sleeping bag. That morning, I woke up and ate oatmeal. As I ate, I looked over my tent and noticed a strange bundle of dried twigs and berries tied with green cord propped against my tent. Internally, I was pissing myself, but I packed my stuff up and took off within five minutes. And no way I bothered going to the summit. I headed straight down. On the way down, I realized there was a pretty heavy fog and I ended up on a side trail that eventually ended and I was lost. I used a compass to eventually reorient myself, and I found the trail again. I made it out with no other incident. However, I come to find out the same morning, a 27-year-old died on the same section of trail as me, and it's possible I would have run into him had I not gotten lost and rejoined the trail later. His family seemed to have scrubbed the internet of several articles on him. The scariest part was knowing that someone knew where I was and watched me, and I had no clue about them. Also, the circumstances surrounding the guy's death are weird. You can find articles about him. He supposedly fell trying to climb out of a ravine, but he was away from his backpack and it called 911, but he didn't get to speak to anyone on the line. This is a true story, and I've been kind of obsessing over what the fuck happened out there. I'll try to keep it as brief as possible without leaving out key details. I grew up deep in the mountains of Shoshone County, an hour from a grocery store. The wilderness is my peace and my home, but these woods, they are evil, and I never should have come to Washington. My wife's uncle bought some land just north of Spokane, Washington, with a friend of the family. They got it at a significant discount because a nearby aluminum smelter had polluted the ground and it was impossible to use the water beneath it. They had set up two plots and each had a camper to live in. Jay had been progressively getting paranoid and saying people were stalking him and watching him in the trees. About three months into living there, a man wandering through the woods there had an interaction with Jay and ended up attacking him and breaking his jaw. Upon being arrested, the man said he was overcome with a desire to see if he could kill him with a single punch. Two months later, my wife's uncle Jay was murdered in his sleep on the couch in his camper. His friend Kay found him and immediately ran as far away until he stopped to call the police. There was sufficient evidence of who did it and they quickly caught the killer who was a 19-year-old boy who said he simply wanted his bike. He beat him to death with a power tool that was lying on the floor nearby, completely bashed his brains in. Kay was completely terrified at all times to be there alone. He had moved in with a family member until eight months later. 
He ended up with nowhere else to go and he had to return. In constant fear, he finally convinced my pregnant wife and I to come stay with him. The second I turned off the highway onto the property, I was overcome with dread. There were at least 250 crows covering the dirt road up to the property. I didn't sleep whatsoever the first night. I stared into the forest, searching for the cause of my intense fear. The energy of this place was so uncomfortable, and I assumed it was simply just knowing that my wife's uncle Jay was killed here. Even the days were eerie. Never did I have a moment where I didn't feel watched here. My wife and I always had a sense of fear, especially after dark. Things sort of normalized for a while, until one day, Kay began puking and feeling very lightheaded all the time. I took him to the hospital and they said he was fine, probably a flu. At this point, it was the anniversary of Jay's murder. Three days after the date of Jay's death, Kay comes running out of his camper screaming, I can't breathe, waking my wife and I up, and we run out to see what's wrong. Kay had gotten into his car and floored it, crashing into a nearby tree. I run up and peer through the window to see the most intense and most primal fear I have ever seen in someone's eyes. He was gasping and clutching his chest. Moments later, he breathed out one last time, and he was dead. We gave him CPR for 30 minutes until EMS arrived. On July 10th, one year and three days after moving there with Jay, and they both were dead. Now it's only the wife and I alone on the property. Every moment living in fear and not understanding what had happened here. I don't know why we didn't leave right away. One day I come out to get fresh water from a drum we kept and I smell the worst thing I'd ever smelled. The water container had a one inch opening on top and inside the water were bits and pieces of chipmunks like spines and heads. They didn't fall in. Something ripped them apart before putting them inside. The nights were getting worse and worse. I never saw anything other than shadows messing with my eyes. I was nearly always filled with unease and intense fear. Fear in the woods, even at night, is new for me. We all get a little spooked in the thick of the wilderness in pure darkness, but compared to my home, this wasn't even a wilderness. The snapping of branches and pine needles crunching underfoot haunted my every night. The screeching owls loved to chime in right at the height of anxiety. My nights were spent peering into the pines, watching, always waiting for whatever evil to present itself. I knew it was out there, and it wanted me to know it too. One night, my wife and I return home to having the worst feeling I've ever felt. Every second driving up the long dirt road increased my anxiety tenfold. Something bad was ahead, and it was clear. The thick fog shrouded the pines. If it wasn't for the glimmer of the full moon, it would have been pitch black. Everything looked different, although it was right where we left it. Nothing seemed out of place. Looking around, I suddenly see this orange, long-haired manged cat sitting on a stump. The cat's eyes were so intense, fiery, almost glowing but not quite. The cat, in my mind, was the embodiment of pure evil. I saw darkness in its soul. We started hearing branches snapping, pine needles crunching, seemingly from every direction. The brush was swaying back and forth, clearly indicating something was running within. Here I am still staring at this cat, almost frozen in fear. Suddenly a voice breaks out, echoing throughout the forest. Hello, is anyone out here? A little girl, I thought, but something was off. My gaze finally breaks with the cat, and my eyes dart towards the road. My wife yells back, Hello, are you okay? Anybody? The voice had changed. Help. Help me. It was the same person or thing yelling, but as if it was trying to disguise its voice. We yelled back several times without response. Somebody fucking help me. 
the most intense, shrieking, evil-sounding voice of a woman called out. It cut deep into my body. I'm filled with more intense fear than I can ever describe. But my wife, she's overcome with the need to find this person, and she started to head off into the forest without a word. I grabbed her by the arm, telling her something isn't right. Why won't she respond? She tries to break free from me to go off alone. I tell her to get in the truck and I'll grab the spotlights, but we aren't going on foot. We roll the windows down, and I shine my intensely bright LED lights throughout the forest. We slowly creep down the road, yelling back. As we get further down the road, the voice strikes out. Please, why won't anyone fucking help me? The sounds are difficult to pin down in the woods, but this one was very close. I hit the brakes and stopped immediately. We shine the lights and yell back, searching. There's no sign of anyone, when suddenly the voice explodes into the cabin of the vehicle, as if they were standing right outside my window. Help me. Somebody fucking help me. Leaving my ears hurting and ringing. I hit the gas and didn't look back. We called the police when I hit the highway, and afterwards they said there was nobody around. I picked up our stuff the next day, and my wife gave birth the following day. We never stayed there again after the baby was born. What the hell could do these things? I have never even believed in paranormal things before, but I don't know what else happened. I went camping with my girlfriend about four-ish years ago in the mountains, just east of where we live. We're both a little hippie, so we brought some toys, juggling bags, Diablo, Poi, whatnot, and we thought it might be fun to bring out our recently acquired brass singing bowls. We have three different sizes that produce different tones, with the middle-sized green bowl being our favorite, in both appearance and tone. If you've ever played a singing bowl before, you know they don't just make the tone by themselves, and it can take a little effort to get the tone out cleanly and clearly. In my opinion, that's kind of the fun of the bowls and coaxing the sound out of it. It adds a little bit of necessary skill, and makes the singing bowls an instrument with a little exclusivity. The second night out there, after bedding down for the night, I wake up suddenly to hear the green bowl unmistakably singing. My girlfriend was in the tent with me, so it definitely wasn't her. Again, they don't sing by themselves. They have to be played. So of course both of us were rightly surprised, perplexed, and admittedly freaked out by the fact that this bowl was singing, seemingly of its own accord. She nudged me to see if I was experiencing the same thing as she was, looked at me wide-eyed and said, Are you hearing this too? I nodded for fear that my speech would cause the bowl to stop. After staring at each other for what felt like an eternity, we quietly resolved to make our way over to the zipper flap of the tent and open it just enough to see what was playing our bowl. However, as soon as we started to move, the bowl stopped, and not just like someone stopped playing it and walked away. No, it stopped. The bowl muted no resonating tone whatsoever. It was like someone had grabbed the edge of the bowl, like you would a cymbal on a drum kit, and silenced it instantly. After the muting, we rushed ourselves out of the tent in the hopes that maybe we would catch sight or sound of whatever it was that decided to stop by and play with our singing bowl. But alas, nothing was there. No footprints, no trail no indication that anything at all had been anywhere near the bowl. We still cannot explain what happened that night, and it's one of those stories that even now sends a bit of shiver down my spine and makes my hair stand a little on end. Whatever played our bowl that night didn't feel hostile or angry, maybe curious and playful, but it definitely didn't want us to know what it was.
I was camping out in the desert with four friends, three females and my older buddy. He's a bit weird but cool. We're all on drugs, it's one of the girls' birthdays, and while they're all sleeping in a camper, we're sleeping in our individual tents. It starts to rain pretty heavy, night falls, and everyone returns to their designated spaces. The girls are loud, but still I'm starting to fall asleep when I hear one of them call my name directly. I wake up. They're now yelling at me to come to the camper. Well, alright. I get dressed, unzip the tent, slosh through some mud, knock on the camper door, and they let me inside. They all look pale-faced and shook. I ask them what's wrong, and they tell me something is outside of the camper. I look around, and the party stayed at the van, rolled my eyes, and told them there was nothing out there. But they insisted and made me wait with them until they heard another sound. I remind them that they're on drugs, so it was probably just auditory hallucinations, but they swear it isn't, and I finally relent and sit down and wait. Minutes pass, nothing but the pitter-patter of raindrops, and then suddenly a scratching sound. It sounded just outside the camper. I tell them it's probably a tree branch, but they say it's something else and to go look. I sigh. I grab a flashlight and head out into the rain to do a circle of the camper. Nothing there. No footprints in the mud. No tree branches anywhere close by either. Weird. But there's nothing there. So I go back in and tell them the coast is clear. They're shook and still unsure. So I offer to just sleep there on the floor for a bit. I'm starting to doze off again when I hear a voice whisper. Can you hear me? Yes, I say, and start to wake up. What's up? And the girls are all silent. One of them finally stirs and says, You heard that too. It wasn't me. I sit up and look around. The other two girls are asleep. We're staring into each other's eyes when suddenly, we both, clear as day, hear a child laughing in the other corner of the van. What the fuck was that? I exclaim, and the girl who was awake says that she's heard the laughing before, and that's what scared her. So we wake up the other two to see if they were messing with us. They weren't. They were annoyed. So now I'm thinking, maybe it's someone's phone. We find all the phones and out them together as well as any other electronic devices. Suddenly there's a loud creaking sound just outside the front door. Christ, I yell out thinking maybe it was my guy friend. No response. I grab a broom and slowly open the door and peer outside, but there's no light and I can't see shit. I close the door and I'm freaking out. Now I'm wondering if some local townies or other campers were fucking with us. More scratching on the side of the camper. Suddenly I remember my friend is all alone, so I start to yell at him to wake up and to bring his guns over because I think there might be people fucking with us. After yelling for him loudly for 10 minutes, he finally wakes up and yells back that he'll be right over. He gets there, and immediately I feel more secure. Two grown-ass men. We can handle this. I catch him up to speed, and he just mocks us and reminds us we're on drugs and imagining it, but I swear it's something real, and he agrees to stay in the camper on the floor with me ready to charge into the night if need be. We go quiet. We wait five minutes, ten, fifteen. We're falling asleep. And then the giggles, the damn child laughter returns from just outside the van. My friend thinks it's one of the girls messing with us and tells us to just go to sleep. They swear it's not them, but he doesn't believe them and just lays back down. Not ten seconds later, there's a loud creak sound again and scratching, and it sounds like someone is just outside. He sits up alert, looks at our horrified faces with the same expression, we told you so, and he rushes out of the camper into the darkness and rain, and we hear him fly around the van yelling, but he comes back and reports, no one was there. We start to talk about the campground being haunted, old burying ground maybe. We don't know. At this point, we're jabbering on just to hear our own voices, 
We all agree to just stay awake until the morning. The sun rises, the rain dries up, we pack up and leave. I'm getting gas in a local town when suddenly the thoughts hit me. I google, psst, can you hear me? And this is when I discover the evil Tron. Yes, friends, a small, sadistic, sinister electronic device that emits creepy sounds and can be attached to any metal surface. It was my weird friend. He had hid it underneath the girl's whippet canister. In fact, it wasn't theirs. It was his canister, and they lifted it from his tent while he slept. But he knew. He knew what they'd try, and he tricked them like a Trojan horse into bringing the device into their camper. I was collateral damage, and he just went with it, silently chuckling to himself. The mastermind. The damn mastermind. The fallout was bad between him and the girls, but I thought it was the best prank I'd ever seen pulled off. To this day, bravo. I was far up north, far north British Columbia, Canada, working in an oil rig camp out in the woods. I was working as a cook. I went out one afternoon for a smoke on the back deck. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon. It was a very quiet, still winter day. It was snowing those kind of big snowflakes that make it look like the world's moving in slow motion. So, as I was standing there smoking, just staring off in the distance, not looking at anything in particular. You know, looking left, right, up and down, and at my feet, whatever. I felt something looking at me. Then I looked straight ahead. About thirty feet or less in front of me was the tree line in the forest, and directly in front of me, in between two trees, I see the most gigantic wolf I've ever seen. This thing sitting looked like it was the size of a man standing. It was massive, sitting there and just staring right at me. We locked eyes, then I looked away for a split second and then looked back and it was gone. I don't know, it just gave me the weirdest feeling. It was definitely like, hey, I see you, I could eat you, but I won't. Okay, bye. It's something I will always remember. Two or three times a year, we vacation in a cabin in the wilderness. Me, my wife, and our three young children and two dogs. I'm no stranger to the wild and have made a lot of multiple day and week solo trips in national parks and even in the Arctic Circle. Yesterday, I went for a ten-mile solo hike. At the farthest point, after two hours, I heard my children arguing, playing, crying, laughing, and calling me from the forest. I was totally alone, and my first instinct was to run through the thick brush and trees to where the sound was coming from, but then I realized that it couldn't be my kids, and that I should just walk on and ignore it. I decided to walk back to the cabin. The whole family was there and never left. I know how my children sound, and I swear it was them. Later I realized the combination of all the sounds, laughing, crying, and playing and whatnot, made no sense. What was this experience? What did I hear? My brother is two years older, and we've probably spent tens of thousands of hours and then some in the woods together. Whether it was building forts or BMX tracks to LARPing and hunting, we've traveled across the US exploring caves, canyons, cliff diving, mountain biking, camping, hunting whitetail, mule deer, wild boar, and whatever else. Since 2016, when we get the time off, I feel like adding this is important because there's genuinely nothing I wouldn't do or fear when I have him by my side, but this time was different. 
and we both felt it. We've had our fair share of adventures and stories to tell of all sorts, but this one has felt like a lingering stain on my memory. We're both mid-twenties, and it was 2019. This was probably my fifth time hunting the area, and the first I brought my brother along. It's a large forest area of public land that has a few country roads which are basically two tracks that stretch miles throughout the area. We make the trip up in my truck with our tents, three in total, one for each of us and another to change in and keep our gear in. Without making this long-winded, we set up camp a couple of miles from the truck, which we drove for quite a few miles through the trails, basically the middle of nowhere. The nearest main road is probably 8 to 10 miles away. We arrived late in the night, set up camp, and quickly fell asleep after a long trip. We spent the next day scouting and tracking, then made back to camp for the night. We cooked, then ate, had some beers and bullshitted. The night was still early, but we had a long day and decided to head off for the night. Everything up until this point was normal. I suddenly awoke to something smacking my tent and hearing my brother's voice call my name. I knew something was off. I called back to him and he immediately unzipped my tent and made his way inside. I could tell that he was disturbed when I went to ask him what's wrong and he immediately grabbed my shoulder and told me to shush. The sun wasn't up yet so I think it was around 4.30 a.m. We sat in my tent and what we heard still confuses me to this day. I can only explain it as whale sounds. Different tones of extremely loud noise that I could feel throughout my body. It would come and go, but there would only be a few seconds of silence in between the sounds. It would vary from high-pitched squeals and everything in between to very low sounds that had literal ground-shaking reverb. I regrettably didn't think to grab my phone or record anything that was going on because what I was hearing didn't seem real and in the moment I was awestruck. The sound went on until daylight started to break. I believe it was about an hour but I'm not really sure. Neither of us spoke and at the time I felt like I could feel the energy around me almost like my body was covered in white noise if that makes any sense. It wasn't even minutes after the sound stopped it started to rain, and one of the craziest thunderstorms while I was camping happened. The forecast didn't predict or account for any rain the days we were going to be there prior to making the trip. All the stakes for the tent our gear was in completely ripped out of the ground, and both of our tents had multiple stakes ripped out as well. Those things we drove into the ground with an axe and would take some insane force to unearth every single one. My brother dismisses it and won't even talk about it, saying it was just machinery being dragged. But at the time, we both shared the same feeling of fear and dread. It just seems odd it was still the middle of the night and we were so far removed from any nearby communities or industry to hear and experience this occurrence. This happened circa 1971 or 1972, when my mother was about 14 or 15 years old. The incident occurred in a heavily wooded area near Montevallo, Alabama. My mother is the oldest of five children, and she has three sisters and a brother, who's the baby of the family. One weekend in the cooler months of the fall, my grandfather decided to take the whole family, my grandmother, my mother, and all my aunts and uncles, so seven people in total, into the woods for target practice with a rifle. My mother grew up quite poor, and they didn't always live in the best neighborhoods, so my grandfather wanted to teach the kids how to defend themselves with a rifle, if need be. Like I said, it was later in the fall, so the trees were bare and there were lots of leaves on the ground. The wooded area was just off a dirt road, so this was a fairly rural area they were in. Since it was so far off the beaten path, my grandfather became startled when he heard the roar of a car engine so deep in the woods. My mom remembered the car as being a blue Ford Galaxy. 
Despite the fact that my grandfather had a gun, he totally freaked out and told my grandma and the kids to hide under a pile of leaves in the woods. He hid with them. The man in the driver's seat got out, dragged a woman's body out of the car, and just dumped her there in the woods and drove away. After my grandfather was sure the man had gone, everyone came out of hiding, and the woman sat up and stared them straight in the face. My grandfather asked the woman if she needed help. She said no, she would be fine. She didn't seem to be injured and obviously didn't want the help. She hadn't put up a fight with the man when he dragged her out of the car. So my father cut the shooting lesson short and decided to rush the kids home to safety. Well, on the trail back to the dirt road where my grandfather had parked their car, they passed the man in the blue Ford Galaxy driving out of the woods. My mom looked over and noticed that he had a huge machete laying across the front seat right beside him. My grandfather made sure that the man could see he was carrying a rifle, but everyone was careful not to give away what they'd just seen. The man struck up small talk with my grandfather, asked him how he was doing and what they were doing out in the woods. My grandfather explained that he'd just taken his family out for target practice with a rifle. The man told him to have a nice day and continue driving. The next day, my grandfather went back out to that spot in the woods. There was not a body there. However, he did find the woman's wig, her purse, some Kleenex, and a pair of eyeglasses. He collected the items and took them home. According to my grandfather, that area of the woods was known for having shallow graves and being a dumping site for bodies. My mother became hysterical when he walked in the door carrying that stuff. She started screaming, he killed that lady, he killed that lady. My grandfather ended up taking the items to the police station, but my mom doesn't think anything ever came of it. She never heard anything else about it after that. Well, she did hear one thing about it, I guess. Early the next morning, my grandmother called my mom when she arrived at work, just before the kids left for school. She told them not to take the bus that day, that she would come home and pick them up and drive them to school. When my mom asked why, my grandmother said, because that car is waiting for you at the bus stop. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, Pie Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracoid, Erica Nicole, 
Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Cow, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.